able to sit down, yeah? Um, so please uh, uh, be seated and as, as we're about to, uh, to begin. Um, thank you very much. My, my name is Ijo Chamber and I'm the Pro Vice Provost for UCL for Africa and Middle East. And so I'll add my welcome to those of, of Yakov to, to welcome you to UCL. And I understand that a number of you have had a very exciting and stimulating day discussing um, this climate change agreement. It's, um, it's a historic and has been acknowledged to be a really historic agreement. Um, I, was, I was looking at the detail and, and I realized the scale of the problem when you consider a committee thinks it's successful to set an upper limit for the temperature rise and not to say that um, actually we don't want further temperature rise, but we do, but we, we want an upper limit. And I think that demonstrates um, the scale of the problem. And this, um, this um, today's event has been all about what this climate change deal uh, means for Africa. We understand that there have been pledges of finance. We understand that um, the relationship uh, between the continent of Africa and a lot of the countries in the continent of Africa and the climate change phenomena is, is, is very asymmetric. They, the, the, um, the burden, of course, Will, will still impact on these countries, but there are no technological dividends, so to speak of, uh, around in, in, in these um, regions. Um, and so, uh, of course, thinking about how one is going to capitalize on this newfound political will and start to generate some new technologies that will enable um, these countries to, to further their development, achieve their ambitions, and possibly even bypass some of the legacy technologies which are still, uh, in some cases, still being used in other countries. Now, for that to happen, for, for, for these um, opportunities to actually deliver some benefits, there needs to be access, of course, to finance, that's, that's clear. And there also needs to be access to some intellectual uh, capacity to, in order to generate these new, um, these new technologies. Now, um, what I think uh, UCL's Energy Institute is trying to achieve is to harness the expertise that is at UCL and work in collaboration with experts in these regions to come up with these new creative solutions. I think that's, that's one of the aims of, of the Energy Institute. Can, can we harness the intellectual expertise in UCL in collaboration with the intellectual expertise in the various countries and, and develop new solutions, which means that the commitment for, not, uh, for, for a, an upper limit for the increase in global temperature is, is actually met, and we don't have then the, um, the negative things such as um, drought, um, inaccess to water supplies, and <coughs> all these things ultimately bring conflict, and we, we are fed up with seeing images of conflict in our screens, and of course the people living in close proximity to that conflict are, are definitely fed up of, of having to, to engage with, with those kinds of issues. We are really, really lucky today to have a very, very high um, um, sort of um, expert panel to debate these issues and you'll get a chance to ask them the questions and to ask them the, the important questions that, that are, are, are um, sort of um, in your mind and I'm sure they look very capable and, and, and chomping at the bit to, to get the answers out to you. Um, you, I know that there was, a, there was a workshop today, and I think before we start with the panel, it's wise to hear what were the key outcomes from that workshop. What was the need? What are the top issues? And um, we have Gabriel to speak about those 
to, to give us a, a wee roundup of what happened earlier today, just to set the scene. So I'm handing over to Gabriel and um, Dal Raja. I hope I got that right. Okay, thanks, Gina. Good evening everybody, I'm Gabriel Anandraja from UCL Energy Institute. So uh, climate change is a, a, it's a global problem, but the solution is local. That means every country needs to work, every state needs to work, everybody has to do something to show down this problem. So as everybody knows, this Paris Agreement is 2 degrees C or even beyond that, talking about 1.5 degrees C. Then it is as most of this GAD emission coming from energy related activities, then what we need to do is we have to move to low carbon resources or take up energy efficiency option and also we need behavior changes. This is one problem, one issue we are looking at. The other issue is for the global south, the energy access is very limited. In Africa alone, more than 600 million people do not have access to electricity. So their aspiration is completely different development first. Then it needs further extension of, extension of uh, energy system, energy infrastructure. Then if you see these two objectives, you might think like conflicting objectives because when, there, when it comes to energy system expansion, then it is always linked to fossil fuel and emission. So we can see it positively, how to make this climate compatible development. Or beyond that, how to go for this sustainable development, that is not only environmentally sustainable, it's socially and economically sustainable development. That is the aspiration of African countries. So in addition to that, even if you limit it to 1.5 or 2 degrees C, then still we have some impact on agriculture sector and all other sectors. Then we need to talk about actually adaptation as well in this case. So that is what we focused in our objectives. So we had the first, first objective is to understand the aspiration or development aspiration of the African people and researchers. What do they, do they really want? Then to identify the research gaps and need in terms of research related to this uh, Paris Agreement. What kind of priorities we need to do in order to make this uh, both objectives, climate change mitigation as well as this sustainable development. The next one is what kind of action plan we need to make in order to increase their participation in this FCC process. Currently, they are kind of the researchers from Africa is underrepresented in this FCC uh, uh, works. These are the three objectives we had. So we had 30 participants. So researchers from African institutions, kind of key experts. You can see our panelists here. They are well experienced with African and who has kind of very good knowledge in the area. Then diaspora based in this UK. Then we have researchers from UCL and other institutions in UK. Then we also have actually development partners from UK and France. So we identified three hey, teams. One is when it comes to, even if it's limited to 1.5 or 2 degrees C, still we will have impact and we need adaptation. So that is one adaptation and agriculture. The second one is the aspiration on development, then it is energy and low carbon development. Then what kind of action plan we need to put them on in order to enhance the African researchers part or scientists participation on this IPCC process. Then if you even if you have all these adaptation, development, capacity escape, these are not enough actually. Because these are kind of necessary condition, but in order to make real, real change in development, we need then climate finance and technology. So these are the three themes we actually focused on. So we were mainly looking at uh, how to identify these gaps and research needs related to the Paris Agreement. Then also, what is the potential collaboration, collaborative research? Then how to actually enhance the capacity, capacity mobilization in, in these areas? Then also, what, how we can actually generate these potential partnership, partnerships actually to undertake research and also capacity development. So from the research, so we had a breakout group. Then we we had a discussion 
or how to uh, identify issues related to this. Then under this adaptation and agriculture. So what we, the, the researchers thought that uh, agriculture should be more than like adaptation. We also look about the mitigation options there in, in agriculture. The main area is the lack of data. So we can think about it, even in developed countries, <coughs> we have issues when it comes to research. The problem is lack of data and uh, certain knowledge. Then we also need to look at the fundamental question, whether the, the agriculture de sector development, whether it should be a commercial, large scale, industrial scale <coughs> development, or it's a small farmer scale. So that's the fundamental question on pathways for agriculture development. Then how to keep this agriculture development within the climate policy and climate agenda? That is another area to look. What is Africa's responsibility? To aim for a reduction in agriculture, especially in this land use related emission. That is key when, it, when we talk about expanding agriculture sector. So energy and low carbon. So the main, actually key issues is this institutional condition in African countries. Are they in the right setup, uh, right uh, state in order to invite and uh, encourage investors in low carbon technologies to invest there? So that is what we need to further understand. That is what we say is better understanding of institutional arrangement. That is the key part in this when it comes to uh, low carbon energy development. The second thing is because people are also talking about this micro grid, mini grid, distributed generation, and all these things. Then how do you want to integrate all these things? What is when is the right time to connect it with this main grid? So a lot of issues are there. Then we really focused on energy islanding, kind of, what kind of topology and scale of energy networks, how do you want to set up it. So then another area is the focus not only be in the electricity, so we should look beyond that, it's like transport, how we want to decarbonize transport sector. Another key area is the small and medium enterprises, they are kind of key <coughs> and behind most of these emission, actually, they are responsible probably in certain countries over 70% of the emission come from these small enterprises. So how do we want to work with that? All these issues need to be actually looked up. Then another problem is when it comes to renewable energies, the main issue is it's, it's too expensive. The problem is the fossil fuels, fossil fuels are subsidized. So how do you want to deal with this? So that is the coherence of pricing and subsidies. This is Another key area actually in, 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 in energy and low carbon development to look at. So I, I guess this uh, UNFCC actually required this uh, RPCs to produce a report on impact of this uh, raising temperature to 1.5. I think the report is due probably in 2018. So the question is so far on this IPCC assessment and reports, Normally, the researchers from Africa is underrepresented. So, how do you want to actually increase their participation in the process? Then that will also actually reflect in the reports kind of what is their aspiration in terms of development. So, the immediate thing is uh, develop a concept note to bring all institutions together in this. That's the first thing to do. The th second thing is we need we we have a small number of networks or small networks in Africa, but we need to actually enhance our research networks in Africa. That is kind of meeting the key people and also explain them, help them understand what, how this MPCC work. So this is another area we need to look. Then most of the time we also talk this capacity and engagements kind of bringing researchers from Africa to UK or other countries to train them. But here the people are also interested in implementing these training courses in Africa. That's another area. So then identify these key people, researchers, who could be the lead authors or chapter lead scientists, then train them or develop training program them so that we can actually enhance the, uh, their participation in FPCC. So the, the key part is, so even though we have all these things, the next thing is when it comes to low carbon development, the finance, where does it come from? So then one thing is, many African countries actually develop or invest in renewable actually from the domestic or public finance. 
So then do we need to actually look at uh, or recognize the difference between the role of domestic versus international finance or international sources? That is one thing. The second one is, <coughs> what does Paris Agreement ambition of this 1.5 degree C means for Africa in terms of finance and technologies? at country level, because the, the need is different for different countries. We need to understand it. <coughs> so then the next thing is, the, how do we better steer the condition of investment towards core benefits and wider deployment or development of its objective? So in, or, in, in addition to focusing this low carbon development and climate change mitigation, reducing emission, how these finance actually can increase their energy aspiration and development aspiration, that is another thing. So, and also, they also have this INDCs and DCS, NDCs, that is nationally determined contribution. That is actually not deep enough in order to meet these uh, global climate targets. So, how we can actually work further on that to reflect that, what kind of, or analyze what kind of finance and technology needs we need to provide, or the developed countries need to provide in order to achieve this deeper reduction at domestically. Then what type of country level strategy can best streamline climate change into economic development? That is the key part, because their energy access is very low, they are the, their income level is very low, then this climate finance, <coughs> This is uh, the development, and everything should contribute to the sustainable development, sustainable development in terms of socially, economically, and environmentally. All these needs to be achieved. So, what is next? So, UCL will prepare a report based on this uh, discussion and outcome because I couldn't. I had only ten minutes here. I couldn't summarize all key actually points discussed and identified in the workshop, so we will make a report and make it available. The intention is to circulate uh, paper among the kind of who attended the meeting, as well as the development partners. Then this paper will address what priority issues and needs related to the Paris Agreement, potential collaborative research and capacity development to address issues and needs, and potential partnership to undertake research and capacity development. These are the kind of key issues identified. As I said before, many key issues actually identified, but those will be reflected <coughs> in, the, in the report that UCA will prepare. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, I, I will, what I will do now is quickly introduce our distinguished uh, guests and then move towards the, uh, the, the, the discussion. Um, so I'm, uh, I will introduce, you know, from uh, me, my immediate right is uh, Dr. Fatima uh, Denton, who is the Director of Special Initiatives uh, Division and Coordinator of the African Climate Policy Center at the UN Economic Commission for, uh, for Africa. Uh, Dr. Denton, has, you know, is well known to at least to, to many of us, you know, who work in this field, um, has led numerous climate-related uh, climate programs, and is considered to be one of the leading players in the field, particularly in so far as um, uh, climate and development in Africa is concerned. Um, Dr. Uh, Michel Colombier um, that is a scientific director at the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations, uh, also known as IDRI. Um, you know, Michelle is a renowned scientist with a global reputation, and it, uh, we are very uh, privileged to have him amongst us. Dr. Said uh, uh, Moulet is uh, the director, uh, general director of the National Agency for the Development of Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in Morocco and is considered to be a major player in renewable energy development within his country, but also beyond uh, in, in, <coughs> in the region. Uh, Professor Yuba Sokona, who is Vice uh, Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. Uh, uh, Yuba has uh, held numerous leadership roles across, uh, across Africa, including um, prior to, uh, to Fatima taking over, 
uh, coordinator of the African Climate uh, Policy Center at the UN Economic uh, Commission uh, for Africa. And finally, right at the end, is Ambassador Saini Nafo. Um, chair, he's, he's a young man, of course. Um, chairperson of the African group of negotiators and probably the, the busiest man there is in, in Africa at the moment. Uh, he will hold this, uh, this post for the next two years, am I right? Uh, Saini is one of the rising stars in the climate space, a real believer in global solidarity to solve climate change challenges, and a strong advocate of the importance of economic transformation as a vehicle to building resilience. So the first question goes to, to Saini, after I've picked him up you know, in this way, he, he will have to carry the, the, the big weight of uh, the first question. Um, as head of the African group of negotiators, can you explain to us in five to seven minutes what are the key outcomes? Hopefully, five minutes, not seven minutes. What are the key outcomes of the Paris Agreement? Did the Paris Agreement adequately meet the African <coughs> negotiating position? Uh, thank you, Jacob. I think I'll I'll try to address this in uh, in a number of points. First, uh, one fundamental dilemma, two paradoxes five objectives and three pillars. The one fundamental dilemma, and it's going to be in five minutes. I, I love this watch for this reason. There's one fundamental dilemma uh, African negotiators deal with, and this is negotiators at the expert, ministerial, and heads of state level, which is how do you align the need for an adequate global climate regime you know, to deal with the problem in the long term with the urgency of action now? So that's the fundamental dilemma. How do you plan for 20 or for uh, 2100 and the, and, and the now? Uh, there's two African paradoxes we deal with in, in, in trying to, to address that, that one dilemma. The first one is Africa is but represent 2.3 or so uh, uh, percent of global, global emission. Uh, so that's, that's a, very, uh, a very small amount of the problem. Um, the continent is the most affected by climate, re, uh, by, uh, climate impact and is the most vulnerable. So compare, for instance, to another crisis like AIDS, this is one crisis where the continent, I mean the solutions, to the extent that you can deal with them, you can adapt. You cannot solve climate change by just, uh, uh, by just dealing with policies in Africa. This is where climate diplomacy becomes. But from, a, from a, a policy point of view, it's quite challenging to have one problem you haven't created, which is going to have, you're going to be the most impacted, and then the, res the, the solutions are not uh, only in, in, uh, in Africa. The second paradox is on energy. Uh, least access to energy, uh, the, the highest potential for renewable energy, and actually, despite all the, the initiatives, and there's we started to count them some months ago. We were counting 20. There's about 100. There's an initiative popping in and out, one per week or so. And despite all of that, you actually, uh, scientists are telling us that there'll be more Africans out of electricity in the next 10 or 15 years. How do you, how do you, cope, how do you cope with that? So going into Paris, African heads of state have given five objectives to the negotiators. First, ensuring that the uh, agreement rema remained under the convention, meaning that the key principles of um, the key rights and, and, and uh, duties of the both developed and developing countries remain, uh, and um, developed countries take the lead, but we all go into this together. Uh, the second is that we have a climate change regime which is, which is ambitious and the reference to 1.5 uh, to 1.5 degree in the uh, uh, agreement. This is, this is political. I have an IPCC chair here. We're not going to get into the science of that, but from a political point of view, it was very important to have that reference to give a sense of political urgency and just the reality to some of our colleagues in the islands. The balanced treatment between adaptation and mitigation, again, this is global mitigation <coughs> is the best adaptation in the longer term, but right now, today, for most African countries, they need to adapt, they need to integrate climate change in the national development planning process. Four objective, the predictability of climate finance, again in the agreement, having some visibility post 
the $100 billion goal, which was, which was also set, a new target needs, to, uh, needs to, uh, to emerge. So in Paris, we negotiated an agreement, a legal agreement, but next to that legal agreement, there were two fundamental initiatives to deal with the urgency of climate change in Africa. One on renewable energy, which has two targets, a 10 gigawatt target by 2020, and uh, at least 300 gigawatt target by 2030. Uh, that renewable energy initiative received a declaration of support from the G7, EU, and Sweden, a $10 billion commitment. But really, for me, the most important outcome for that initiative was not the $10 billion commitment, but a commitment that all the partners of Africa will come under that initiative to align and harmonize and work. So I think that framework now, for me, having a specific space and interface so that we can engage with our partners, we can go into this together, I think is the most important outcome. And the second is we are working as well with our partners from the South. So we, we are working on an Africa-China uh, Renewable Energy Action Plan, an Africa-India Renewable Energy Action Plan, and this one framework. And we are building a similar framework for adaptation as well to deal with climate services, having each African or all African uh, countries have an adequate uh, climate service by 2020, institutional capacity <coughs> building, financial, uh, financial instruments as well. Two things which were lacking, I mean, w w two things for Marrakesh, where we'll be working on, is uh, having the flexibility and prioritization uh, for, to access finance for Africa. We're not able to get, us to get that strongly reflected in the agreement. And the second, uh, the second mishap, if I can call it that way, is the pre-2020 uh, adaptation finance. And I can get, uh, I'll get into that. Unfortunately, adaptation finance is but 16 or 18 percent of total climate finance, and it's not going up. And uh, we are keen to have an adaptation, uh, a pre-2020 adaptation finance goal. And I think this is something we can do. Six minutes, I'll stop here. All right. <laughs> I think that deserves a <coughs> <laughs> Are you all here right at the end? Is it? Yeah? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, okay. A little difficult, though. A little difficult. I think, you know, the next uh, speaker will be louder. So uh, <coughs> we, we expect, you know, <coughs> the, uh, so you, Yuba, the, you, you're next. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So the question is um, twofold, I suppose. You know, the first one is, how do you consider what what do you consider to be the main findings of the IPCC uh, fifth assessment report regarding climate uh, change in Africa? I know there's a lot of material there, but what do you consider to be the, the most critical? And in relation to that, you know, what contribution did the IPCC's uh, report play in shaping the Paris Agreement? Huh. You ask me to condense 2,000 pages in two minutes. Let's, 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 let's keep the, the second question. Let's leave <laughs> okay. the first question out. Yeah. The, this is not an easy question because you can find in IPCC anything that uh, can uh, respond to any question any place in the world. And then because it gives... Uh, and then it's uh, it uh, it is not easy, but I will take as we are focusing on uh, the African context. I will pick three main elements through the report. Those are not only the, the 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 only element. One is related to the urgency of the action that is needed, and then that I think that 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 has been also. Uh, uh, the, the, this has been highlighted in form the Paris Agreement, the urgency of the action, because for the first time we have seen uh, more than one and, uh, 150 head of the states and then to be on the table. And then that, that thing, something happening, because if something that happening, if not urgent, and then those will not be there. And then the second element related to the African context is the decarbonization of the economy. And then starting the energy sector, and then I will link also the implication for the African context uh, of that. And then this come up is related to the first one, 
And this is one of the critical element. If you want to solve the climate problem, we have to decarbonize the energy, the economy, and then starting the energy systems, the energy sector. And then the third element, the, the, I will have four. I said three, but I will take four. And then the third element is that we cannot disconnect climate and sustainable development. And then there is a close link between, because you cannot solve at all the climate issue without not addressing sustainable development. And then you cannot properly treat sustainable development without the climate. And those are the close link between the two, emerge also with the uh, uh, Paris Agreement. And then the third element, this is also one of the critical findings, is that the nature of the global common issue problem. And there's no way a small or a set of group of countries can solve deal with the climate issue. It's a collective action, it's a collective problem, it's a collective solution you have to bring it. But the details, how that will happen, uh, is another question. And those are some of the key findings, and I think that all of those elements uh, inform the parties. And then this also related to the African context, because as Seni indicated the problem of the continent is the development issue. And then we know also that the continent will be hit by development issue. And then for the first time in the history of climate change, the African came to the negotiation to Paris with a concrete proposal on the table that is aligned with the finding of the IPCC. Because we, he said that the uh, emission of the continent is negligible. You can phase out today all the emission for the continent. It will not make any impact on the problem we are facing. But the continent decided to develop an energy system of the continent based on massive deployment of renewables. And then he gave a figure of 10 gigawatt of renewable by now in 2020. And it's peanut if you look at the uh, needs of the continent. But if this is a massive undertaken by the continent, because roughly uh, every year, everything included, fossil, renewable, everything, the continent put on the, uh, on the, the system one gigawatt per year. Now in 2020, 10 gigawatt, and then compared to one gigawatt per year, all included, is a massive undertaking. And then between 2020 and 2030, 300 gigawatt. This is a massive undertaking for the continent, and then that gives the perspective if all the country and then all those who are involved in the climate process take that route and then we can lead to the decarbonization in an earlier stage as that has been very well articulated in the IPCC findings by the deployment of the renewable and then the different, uh, different elements. Uh, and I think that, and then the, the, the fact also that that has been undertaken by the continent, it is not uh, to reverse also the, 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 the global thinking in bringing that in the context of sustainable development. Because we do it at the same time, those are some of the core benefits also that has been highlighted in the IPCC report that respond to local, to the national, to the regional perspective at the same time we solve the climate problem. And then the details of that, that then came later. And those are some of the elements I just wanted to offer in your broad questions that need at least uh, one month of lecture at the university here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Yuba. That was a uh, tour through the force. Uh, I mean, I was going to uh, go to, uh, to Fatima with a, with a fresh question. But while we are at it, while we are still discussing the uh, questions around mitigation, around energy, perhaps I could call uh, Michel Colombier uh, to ask him, does the Paris Agreement adequately deal with the climate mitigation issues in, in Africa to supplement you know, the discussion that Yuba started. Why should Africans be interested in decarbonization 
given several countries have discovered new resources of oil and gas. We're in a dilemma. <coughs> well, um, I think I start by answering your second. Sorry? This is the mic. Yes. It's okay? Okay, so I was just saying that I, I start by responding to your second question. Um, because we can ask ourselves why Africa would bother with climate change in terms of mitigation. Uh, a number of countries in Africa are oil producers, and as you say, they have discovered new resources. And for the majority of countries, they certainly ha have other priorities that you mentioned already, that are energy access, etc. And so why mitigation should be in the agenda? And I think this is very much related to the paradigm shift that is one of the reasons I think we had a success in Paris. And this paradigm shift is, deals with not just the problem we have, but the way we represent the solution to the problem, which is very important. And for years, we have negotiated a problem where the solutions that everybody was having in mind was the idea of a burden, that climate change was a burden to be imposed on the economy, and that we had to share that burden among countries. And obviously, in this vision, in this paradigm, for developing countries, and especially for Africa, there was a good reason to say, because of common but differentiated responsibility, we should not be first in taking that burden. We have other priorities. We have other things to do. And so we should delay action in developing countries, which was the natural way, uh, natural thing to do. I think what has changed in the preparation of Paris since, since Cancun, in, in the climate community as a whole, in the academic world, in the think tanks, in the private sector, and progressively in the negotiators, uh, I would say, software, is that now the way we represent the solution is the vision that what we are after is a transition to a new economy. It's a new paradigm, it's a new economy with different economic regulation, with different institutions, and with different technological pattern. And if what we are after, all the countries of the world, is to shift to that new economic model, then it becomes crucial for Africa to be part of that move, not to stay on the line, not to stay apart from that, from that change and to be part of that movement. So, the, what, so the, the objective for Africa, I think, na quite naturally now becomes how to leapfrog, how not to do exactly the same development of, as we did and later on maybe uh, be concerned with decarbonization or whatever, the day you, ha you have big emissions, but how to leapfrog to that new model. And obviously the question of equity, etc., remains but it's now different. Now the question is for Africa to turn to the wider community and to the Paris Agreement and to look to what extent the Paris Agreement brings to Africa collective action that will help Africa in this transition and also solidarity. And I think these are the elements that maybe uh, Sani has already mentioned, but I want to mention on the Paris Agreement. Why I think this framework that we've negotiated in Paris is more certainly more attractive for Africa, now we need to operationalize it, but more attractive for Africa than the former framework that we were negotiating. First element, we have this INDC approach, uh, intended nationally contributions. This is very important, na nationally determined contributions. This is important because instead of having an, abstractive, an, ab an abstract discussion on figures and emissions and reductions, etc. What we are now discussing is a very pragmatic policy framework for the countries. And this allows for a breakdown at sectoral level. What are the issues that I need to deal with in my country? <coughs> what are the issues in agriculture? What are the issues in energy access? What are the issues in terms of urban development and the access of people? We have also the, the SDGs in 2015 with a list of SDGs. And in those SDGs, we have a lot of, of them that relates to urban conditions and the access to public services, transportation, health, education, etc. All these needs energy also. Um, so this is the first point. The second point with INDC is that each country, while putting forward its INDC, can make its own choice, its own priorities. And this is very important because Africa is a diverse continent. 
you, have, you had a very unite voice during Paris for the first time, no. and it was uh, at that point. <laughs> not, it was not the first one. So sorry. Uh, Copenhagen. Yeah, Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. But it was a success. <laughs> not, not your fault. Um, but, but behind this, we have a, a big diversity of situation in Africa. For instance, oil importers and uh, oil dependent, etc. And so INDC approach also allow for this um, diverse approach to transition that is needed. The third one was mentioned already is that in the Paris Agreement, I think we have this convergence between adaptation, mitigation, and finance in the, in the global objective of the community. And we have the three of them together, which is very important. I think the fourth element is collective action. Paris is not just about putting forward unilateral commitments, countries putting their indices. It is about developing collective action. And one important dimension of collective action, for instance, is the technological pool that the Paris direction is giving to a number of technologies, including renewables. And I think this is of mutual benefit for Africa and the rest of the world, because having this technological pool, this vision of the need and ways forward to the development of renewables, we need Africa to do this because it's, a, it, it's an important opportunity for the world to develop renewables and Africa also can benefit from that pool. And so collective action is important. This is important for technology. It's also important on the, I would say, the traditional energy because obviously having this agreement and implementing climate policies will have an impact on fossil fuel prices, which for the time being is important because most countries also in Africa are oil dependent and uh, the oil bill is something that is very important for them. The fifth element, I think, is solidarity. Um, this is more than just collective action. Yes, we need to bring support to Africa, and I think this was demonstrated, and you mentioned this already, through finance, through the loss and damage scheme, which is still very theoretical, but it's important to have recognized the need to put in place this loss and damage scheme and also uh, on the diverse points on capacity and technology. And finally, I think it's important to see that in Paris we have INDCs, we have this collective framework for action, and we have this other, this other agenda for solutions by other actors than just state actors, including regions, including cities, including <coughs> private actors, and this is the way we can bring also a lot of initiative to support the dynamic of the Paris Agreement. It was instrumental in being able to have an agreement in Paris, and I think that the preparation of this agenda was important from that point of view, but now it is also instrumental in the, impl in the concrete implementation of the Paris Agreement and the way forward. Thank you, thank you, Michel. Uh, <coughs> just as a way to try and put some balance in our, in our discussion, now, I'd like to call the, um, Fatima Denton um, <coughs> to, to intervene. Africa are growing rapidly at the moment, <coughs> and uh, further prosperity is required to lift people out of poverty and improve material standards of living. Now, while the, there is this, this need, while there is this requirement you know, to move towards uh, enhancing well-being, um, but there is also a challenge in trying to preserve what is there already. So, so from your perspective, how do you think was the, the adaptation challenge uh, dealt with in the Paris Agreements? Um, what did you feel was uh, important within that, but also what were the missing pieces in this? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jakob. Um, probably let me just start by making um, sort of three observations um, in terms of the Paris Agreement itself. Um, I think the first one is, um, somebody mentioned this word shift, but I think the first one is the, the Paris Agreement itself did mark um, a shift in terms of our development model. So in many ways, it's almost like a, a nail in the, the coffin um, of the fossil fuel industry. Um, in many ways, it, it kind of gave us the political license to decouple 
um, fossil fuel use from prosperity. In other words, for us to grow, we don't have to grow with fossil fuel. We <coughs> can find a way um, out of that, and we can also have um, a trajectory that is more or less to leaning on a kind of decarbonized um, pathway, which I think is something that you was mentioning. Um, the second shift, um, I guess, is, um, is almost like a shift in behavior as well. Um, and I think we talk a lot about the solidarity aspect in terms of um, this is a way, the Paris Agreement in many ways is also supporting Africa in terms of its transition towards renewable energy. But I think pe sometimes people don't talk about the solidarity the other way around. Uh, much of Africa is already green. So in many ways, countries in Africa do have the right to also go at it in a different way. They can choose a different development model. So my sense is that by going the non-fossil fuel way, it's also um, a mark of solidarity to the global planet um, to support um, a trajectory that is not based on you know, the kind of business as usual um, um, way of doing things. Um, and I guess um, the third shift um, for me is um, it probably signals to the rest of the world and to global economies that a two degree pathway uh, would require massive <coughs> um, and um, a massive shift in investment flows as well um, towards renewable energy, which is something that has already been discussed. But I think in that, there is a huge opportunity for Africa um, to be able to move towards cleaner um, and, and greener sort of um, technologies. So these are sort of three sort of observations that I wanted to make. But I think in terms of, um, I'm forgetting the question now. <laughs> um, in, terms of, in terms of, okay, let me, let me just talk about some of the tension that I see as well. Because I think everyone talks about this being a landmark event, um, this being a, a, a sort of um, a deal um, that has taken us out of the deadlock of 20 years. Uh, but I also think that in many ways it has reinforced a number of tensions as well. Um, for me, at least the first tension is that um, in as much as we know that countries are going to shift towards new sources of energy, and there are al already countries in Africa that have got very bold uh, renewable energy targets, uh, very ambitious INDCs or NDCs, um, but may not have the necessary means to finance these um, ambitions and these, these, these technologies. So I think um, it's, it has reinforced the tension between the imperative to develop um, green economies and the means to do so. Um, um, and so I in some ways I see that, I see that as a tension. Um, possibly the other tension that I see is the one that Saini referred to. They, there is this temporal challenge in, in many ways, because the agreement um, for many people was like a, a point of hope, but at the same time, um, the actions have been delayed until 2020, um, and we know that we're going to see some kind of a lock-in effect, so what does that mean? Um, and we might probably peak before we arrive at uh, a kind of zero overall emissions, emissions in the second half of the century. Um, so, some people have said, um, is this about sort of kicking the can down the road, or are we going to be able to do something, something concrete um, in the next um, couple of years? And the temperature guardrail <coughs> is important, but what does that mean for Africa? Um, I think it was Desmond Tutu that said that, um, you know, two degrees would almost mean the incineration of the continent. Um, so what do we mean by two degrees? Uh, 1.5 degrees is already very catastrophic um, in many of the um, economies of Africa, especially those that are climate sensitive. Um, but for me, as imperfect as the deal is, I think it's a good start, because um, as someone said before, um, it is um, a token of um, um, solidarity and um, the world coming together to be able to um, find find solutions um, to this to this um, um, climate um, challenge. But another another point I wanted to make um, 
is about the the opportunities that we have for um, adaptation, I guess, um, because much of the adaptation that we would need to make cannot just be resident within the NGOs, yet m much of the action or much of the ambition to adapt is coming from NGOs. Um, there are a lot of NGOs that are putting forward uh, project proposals um, and you know, thinking about ways in which to attract funding for adaptation. Uh, but yet we know that um, um, governments have a key role and are a key player um, in terms of um, the way in which um, adaptation needs to happen um, and the way in which they can coordinate adaptation activities um, across the continent. Um, I think we also have to talk about the the fact that many African countries are growing and are growing rapidly, um, although it's been said that the growth is not very inclusive. But there is also this imperative to industrialize. Um, and we know that much of our industrialization is sort of commodity-based industrialization. We're producing, but we're not adding value to what we're producing. Um, so I guess um, some of the key ingredients that would help us to industrialize is um, a, a, a you know, um, the, the sort of energy inputs and the energy resources that we need, um, the kind of energy um, corridors that we can, we can create um, within regional economic zones that have the potential to, to industrialize. Um, the way in which we can deploy carbon resources to arrive, at, um, or, or non carbon resources to arrive at this form of um, industrialization. But I think it's, it's important to say this is an imperative for Africa. We definitely have to um, industrialize, although we're thinking about industrializing in a, greener, in a greener fashion. And there are countries that have already shown that this is, um, this is possible. It's not, um, um, it's, not a, it's not an illusion. So um, in my sense, I think that there are, there are several things that are still more or less tension points um, and it would be good to see how the Paris Agreement, um, in terms of its enforcement in, in certain areas, we can, we can create some sense of um, pressure points, um, especially when we're talking about INDCs, to see um, basically how we can measure and measure credibly um, the progress that some countries are making towards realizing their, their NDCs. Um, I think also we need to be able to have a clear sense of um, what are we adapting towards um, and also to be able to see the kind of um, resources um, uh, and the extent of these resources that we need um, because we know that there is um, definitely a decline um, in terms of overseas development um, assistance. Um, there has been a lot of talk about the 100 billion a year. Um, so what we need to put on the table is what would the new adequate mean? Uh, because there's always been this talk about adequacy and additionality and transparency, but that 100 billion a year we haven't been able to achieve. So what, what would the new adequate, adequate source of funding look like? Um, and how can we shift those funding uh, to the people on the ground to the, to the <coughs> most, um, most needy of that? Um, I could talk about other aspects related to technologies, but um, I'll stop there for now. We'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Um, I mean, that's great. Now, I think, I, you know, the next, the next question is to, to, uh, to cite, and in a sense, you know, Mor Morocco is, has become one of the, uh, the leading lights when it comes to uh, uh, energy or renewable energy in particular. We just wanted to know what are the kinds of lessons that other African countries can draw from the experience of, uh, of Morocco? Thank you. I thought it's very important to know that when I was uh, hearing that, especially in the field of renewable energy, it was considered as expensive. Uh, COP7 was in Marrakech already yes. in 2001, and we had an agreement. We had an agreement concerning the agreement <coughs> of Marrakech for CDN, but look at the result 15 years after. Less than 3% of the project financed through the CDN went to Africa. 3%. And since that time, we were talking inside the country about how to have a strategy for renewable energy. 
the Ministry of Finance and they said, why should we go to renewable energy? A Moroccan is emitting seven times less greenhouse gas than an European. We can continue to build small power plants. It's cheaper and will be much, much lower emitting country like uh, as uh, other countries in Africa. In 2008, the price of barrel was almost around $100 on the war, and the energy bill in Morocco reached $10 billion. Then we managed to convince all actors not to develop a project of renewable, but to have a strategy including project with renewables, industry integration, social impact in the region where we're developing the projects. When you look at all the economic linked to renewables, and because of the price of, at this time, of fossil fuel, we, it was a big decision, and we had a chance at the highest level of the state, the king of the, of the country, sent a letter saying, priority to renewable energy and energy efficiency in our energy policy. 2009. So, very proactive policy. Second point, regulation and legislation. We changed the law concerning electricity. We put a law putting no barriers for development of renewables <coughs> by the public sector or by the private sector. We create dedicated institutions. I'm at the head of ADERE. ADERE is the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Development Agency. At the same time we have project uh, policy for renewable energy, we have policy for energy efficiency. You need to do it both at the same time. It's very important. Third point, objective to reach. Africa is looking for 10 gigawatt of renewable energy power for the next 10 years? <coughs> no. no, five years? Four years. Four years. <coughs> China is building 20 gigawatt each year of wind today. All over the world, 40 gigawatt of wind every year. In Morocco, we decided to have 6 gigawatt in 2020 of renewables. We were, in 2009, around 2 gigawatt. We're going to we add 4 gigawatt in the next 10 years. During the COP21, the King speech at, uh, in Paris announced 52% of our capacity will come from renewables in 2030. Now we have visibility until 2030. That means that why we are going like that? We manage not just to do the investment. We are not doing the investment. The private sector is doing the investment. It's very important when talking about mitigation today if you put the institution dedicated, if you put transparency in the tenders, you have many private companies com coming from all over the world. We had 90 groups coming for a tender for the wind project of 850 megawatt. 19 groups from all over the world who wants to invest in wind parks in Morocco. We didn't put any feed-in tariff. It's by the tender that you fix the tariff we reach three cents per kilowatt hour price. And last point, we reach 70% of industry integration in Morocco. We're just starting uh, Blades uh, industry in the country with other partners, with European partners. So the approach, that's why I'm not so really scared about mitigation, and especially for Africa. <coughs> we have huge, huge potential for renewable energy in all over Africa. Of course, we're talking about wind and solar and hydro, huge hydro. But what is the real needs? The real needs is the infrastructure. When you, need, when you have big projects linked to renewables, you need infrastructure to distribute electricity. And this is the key issue. We are stopping some projects in Morocco because we are waiting that the grid infrastructure to be developed. And we are very soon connecting to Mauritania to have because there's a huge wind regime in this area where we can develop many projects, giving electricity for many countries in the region. When you have this strategy in mind, you're not looking just as one project. You're looking for all these impacts of renewables. And knowing the price of renewables today, we're in new paradigm. 
So that's why I'm not scared about money or financing such projects. But the needs are really to have confidence in the country. Those projects are for mid or long term projects. We're talking about 15 to 20 years projects. So for a private company to invest for 20 years, of course, they need confidence. They need governance. They need transparency. So that's how we managed to have those projects realized in Morocco. We just uh, connected to the grid the solar plant in Wazazat, the biggest thermal solar plant, with new technology storing heat during the day. So the solar plant is producing electricity at night. So all this show that when you have the right policy, when you have the right institutions, the right initiation, you can attract green financing, and we manage to have all the development banks, African development banks, European investment banks, AFD, Agence Française de Développement, KFW from Germany, all the banks were looking at our project and financed our project. So it's not a matter of financing. It's really a matter of governance and of policy. You need to give visibility to the promoters, but you need also to have a minimum of infrastructure. It's very important, and I hope that the Green Fund will help developing infrastructure in Africa. Then you'll have the possibility to develop many, many, much more than 10 gigawatt. I'm sure that we'll have many op opportunities for them. So <coughs> that's why the approach to we using public-private partnership can be one of the best solutions, but you need all these points. I don't forget small, power, small renewables. There is a new pricing also for small renewables. Today, you can have households electrified by solar home system in a very good way, in a very cheap way. It's not, it was not the case 15 years ago when we started world fixation in Morocco. We managed to electrify the country in 15 years from 25% of electrification rate to 99% today. We managed to do that with an approach with the utility by all the consumers in the country paying for world fixation, but also by giving some subsidies for the rural areas and by having also, in some cases, where uh, the grid was very, very too expensive to develop solar home systems. Solar home systems, because of the price of PV today, because of the technology in storage, can play a very important role for electrifying some villages in Africa. <coughs> Last point, solar pumping, linked to agriculture. We are developing a program to finance solar pump, to transfer from diesel pumps to solar pumps. In our policy, we stopped subsidizing fossil fuel. The diesel price increased. Because of the decrease in the price of PV, it's only four years the payback for solar pumps today. It was 10 years before. So for farmer in Morocco, it's only four years to have the payback for solar pump. That's how we managed to convince the financial sector, local banks, to finance such projects. We are reaching 10,000 pumps today. It's the beginning. We are looking at developing that because it will be the more economic way <coughs> of doing pumping water. It will be much, much cheaper than using diesel. So when you have the policy linked to all that, you can manage to uh, reach this result and to reach this uh, approach. And I say it's not a pro project of renewables. It's a strategy for the country, including all that. Training, you need training also people, capacity building. You need also, one very important, R&D. We have a program with universities, it's the last point, R&D, because it's in that strategy. We have, you need to have universities inside the country, in African countries, also involved in the development of those technologies. We're talking about transfer of technology, of industry transfer also. We can do it with African universities, and I'm sure that it's something that can be done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Saeed. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, but before I hand over to uh, Ijoma, uh, let me just quickly throw out you know, some um, items you know, that, 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 that we've heard. I mean, one is you know, this question around vision and leadership, uh, commitment and solidarity. Um, having the you know proactive uh, policies, but also regulations and institutions that are uh, sufficiently transparent for um, to to be able to build confidence. You know, which seems to be 
the, the, the illustrated in uh, Inside's last intervention. So, Jona, please. Thank you so much, Akuba, and thanks to the panel members for really um, answering those questions brilliantly. Do, can you hear me at the back? Great. Not so, so well. Not so well. <laughs> can you hear me now? Does that, does that improve? Okay, so, so we'll play around with this and use this when we respond to the questions. Um, you, you've heard quite a bit, so who, who's going to, to, to fire away with the very first question? There so many things. Excellent. We have a gentleman in the front ready. Well, I could, yeah, I'm here going to Amara, but I couldn't resist uh, saying that it uh, sounds like we could do with the Moroccan policy in the UK, actually, <laughs> <laughs> or, or market confidence, transparency, and consistency. Because you're absolutely right that there is, a, there is a lot of money available to invest in energy projects. What people are looking for is bankable projects, and you've got to set the framework for those bankable projects. But the actual question I wanted to ask, so congratulations, I thought that was fantastic. Um, the question I'd like to ask is, is maybe a provocative one, but I'd be interested in the panel's view. Given that COP is about a number of nation states actually signing up to, uh, to the Paris Agreement, which is, which is great, and there's a fantastic uh, you know, motivation for that to happen, but I'd like the views of the panel on are the country, are the national boundaries of Africa right in terms of geographical boundaries to make renewables work and make access to energy really work? Or do the actual national boundaries conflict with that sort of geographic uh, ambition that would be more logical for a renew renewable state? So how does that fit? What's the panel's reaction? Right, so uh, what I'm going to do is pass over to Senyu to really talk about whether the boundaries <coughs> facilitate or hamper the, 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 qu the answer is simple. It, I believe that it does facilitate. I mean, there's a number of power poles uh, right now in, in, in Africa, the West African power pole, the one for the whole of the uh, uh, southern eastern African region. You have a number of um, uh, water, uh, uh, water organized, regional water organizations. So in reality, in reality, the uh, uh, the national boundaries have been actually uh, uh, integrated in, in a regional approach. I think there's a number of challenges still, and uh, uh, the good doctor from Morocco alluded, one is transmission lines. Uh, getting finance for transmission lines is, 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 is quite a difficult one, uh, let alone distribution. Um, the whole issue about uh, regulatory and policy, uh, this is um, quite sensitive from a political point of view. So it's difficult from country to country, let alone having uh, um, regional uh, regulatory frameworks. But again, that's also an opportunity. If, for instance, from a private sector point of view, you are able to have one, let's say, one framework for, 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 for PPP over 15 countries, I mean, that would definitely reduce the transaction cost. And, uh, so it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is, yes. <laughs> Excellent. So what I'll do is I'll pass over to Saeed whether you want to talk about any Im impact on your neighbours, the kind of excellent work you're doing. Well, uh, of course, uh, when we're talking about our neighbours, we are connected to the grid of Spain, we are connected to the grid of, to the grid of Algeria, and we're going to be connected to the grid of Mauritania. Uh, we are exchanging electricity, uh, but we, are not, we don't have the same policy. Of course, Algeria is oil producing country. Very cheap price. And one of the key issues is that the domestic price has a fair price of energy. When we stop subsidies to uh, fossil fuel, of course, taking in account some social issues, the price of electricity for the social uh, uh, population, for the uh, low income population, is not the same as for those who, pay, who are uh, consuming more. Mm -hmm. So that's very important to have the right price, the fair price for energy. But at least you, have, you need to have this right price to develop this policy. It's not possible to have uh, energy efficiency policy in, in, very, uh, in countries where the price of energy is too low because nobody will invest because it will be uh, a long term to have payback. So that's very important to have this. Second point, 
is uh, with uh, Mauritania is to have infrastructure, even inside the country. Nouadhibou and Nouakchott are not connected. You need to connect big cities between them, then you can develop project, and you'll have, you can reach with that cheap price, even with renewables. So that's very important to have this. Okay. Thank you so much. Another question from the audience. Hello, my name is Bennett. Um, I'm quite interested. You say that you're able to produce three cents per kilowatt, and uh, you say that uh, up energy efficiency uptake is not possible for a low tariff. I sense that three cents per kilowatt is very, very low. How did you manage to spin things? I guess that question is for Saeed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How did you manage? <laughs> Thank you. We were amazed by the price. <laughs> I can assure you it was just one month ago when the tender, like, but between the, uh, we had 19 groups answering the tender, and between the last, the last four who were involved in the tender, it was from three to four. So it's not, it's just to show that renewables are becoming more and more economic. And one thing is that because of the tender, because of the sites to have a very good, windy regime in some areas that's why also it's and it's quite uh, the investment it's quite easy to do so it's, it's not in the mountains it's just in flat area with very good wind regime so you can have much more production from the wind windmills so that's why we managed to have this price but this price was done by the private sector it was tender we didn't fix the price okay so the tender for so what happened in in, uh, in dubai also for solar pv plant it's five cents per kilowatt hour. So that's why the price today, because of the wind regime, of the solar regime that you can have in some countries, and because of the situation, you can reach those prices. But the average price of wind is not three. Huh? All over the world, it's more than, or in Europe, it's more six or seven. Huh? So it's uh, around this. So we have to be careful, but things are going down. The price are going down. We are looking in the PVs and in the wind, how and we are quite amazed about that. But maybe the approach and the financing, and the financing is, has a role to play. We managed to have green financing for part of it, but 75% of the project is done by the private sector. So they're financing through the market. Thank you. Um, I'll take your question, and then you'll I'll try and see if I can hand the microphone back. Thank you. Um, my name is um, Afalabi Sonosi. I'm doing MSc in Economics, Energy Policy, and Environmental Sustainability at UCL. Uh, my question goes on the issue of um, energy policy in Africa. It's good to talk about the Paris Agreement, the funds available, but um, have most, most African countries haven't got a concrete um, energy policies as well as I, I know about. Um, is there any plan? concrete energy policy that African co countries are trying to adopt. Then two, um, on the initiative of African solution for African problems. Um, is Africa, are they really looking inward to countries like Morocco to learn about how are they successful in their renewable energy policy or how do they do with their renewable energy? Are they learning from are other African countries learning from Morocco instead of looking towards the West for the solution of a problem all the time? Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm going to give that to you, Yoba, to talk about whether there really is a governance there. No, I think that uh, some mention, I don't know if it's Jacob or someone, every day there is a new initiative on Energy for Africa. Once a week. <laughs> once, once a week. But I, I think that the situation is changing and then for the past few years and the head of the state of Africa and then the big African CEO and then created in West Africa first, that was last July, an uh, African energy leadership group. And then that means at that level, at the level of the head of the state, energy became one of the main and fundamental uh, uh, issue and then to deal with. Second, the new president of the, World Bank, uh, of the African Development Bank 
when he came to the office, before one month, he convened a, a meeting in Abidjan, a conference in Abidjan, and then to launch the initiative of the, of the uh, New Deal for Africa uh, on energy. And then he is, his background is agriculture, but he started with energy. And then that means things are changing. And then the Paris also agreement given opportunity for the continent because the modularity of the renewable does not need, in many cases, to have the large infrastructure of transmission and distribution. Because you can have a mixed system, and then for the small scale, the large scale, the mini system, and then the nature of the renewable energy fit particularly in the African economy, in the African situation. And then all those coming together so that things are moving in the right direction. And the fact also that this African Energy Initiative is a continental initiative. And then it has been conceived only by the African, for Africa. And there is no external intervention on this initiative. It's a continental. And then it's looking at all the African countries, not specifically focusing. And this is a starting point to deal with all those different issues. Fundamentally, the problem he highlighted, we have seen all the various initiatives that is external funded do not look at institutional, organizational, and the other aspect. They only look at how they can get a profit from making business there. And you cannot deal with that unless you deal with those different issues. Things are changing. Thank you. I'll go to Fatima to briefly talk about um, whether you know, there are indigenous solutions to some of these problems. I wanted to come back to the question that was asked about, um, I don't know whether it was sort of national versus um, regional, I think you were asking. And, and also physical attributes of, of, the, of the continent. Yeah. I mean, the response that I want to offer is um, basically, I mean, I think this point was um, articulated by, by Saini, that um, many of the countries in Africa do have these sort of common ways of looking at the problems, you know, when it comes to water, when it comes to energy. And so there are regional sort of um, power pools. Um, that are basically trying to see how they can harmonize um, their policies. Um, you have initiatives such as the African Clean Energy Corridor um, by IRENA, which is also big looking at ways in which you could develop the energy potential um, of African countries, and countries can actually sell energy to each other, um, and it would also support some of their trade ambitions as well across regional economic belts. Um, but I think that a lot of the problems that we have is problems around the kind of regulatory <coughs> frameworks that we need to put in place um, and the way in which those frameworks are <coughs> enforced um, and um, further, further developed. But I also wanted to basically say, um, in response to the, the question that was asked, um, um, I can't remember, yes, about energy, about energy, energy policies in Africa, just to say that um, I think Africa is probably one of the, the, the regions that have you know, one of the most ambitious sort of set of energy policies. Most African countries have either um, very ambitious um, policies on renewable energies, um, very ambitious targets on renewable energies. Most of them in terms of their INDCs or NDCs are looking towards decarbonizing their economies. Um, you know, there are the, the, the white paper uh, um, on, on energy in many of the African countries as well. So I think that the, it's, not, it's not really about the ambitiousness of these um, policies, but it's about how can you actually implement some of the policies. Um, most of the, the, the sector is still very monopolistic, um, and there is not enough in the way in which private sector um, can work very closely with governments. Um, I think this is changing now. Uh, many countries are moving towards uh, a more autonomous um, set of policies um, and structures in place um, that would support um, private sector enterprises. Um, but I think we also haven't made enough room for local entrepreneurs. 
Um, there are many local entrepreneurs um, in Africa that basically just do their own thing. They're not plugged into the system properly. Um, so we need to find a way in terms of how small businesses, um, energy entrepreneurs can grow and that they're not somehow um, 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 limited in many ways by the projects, I mean the policies that are in place because that also has a way of disincentivizing um, local business as well. So I think there are policies in place. Many of the governments are very ambitious, but the problem is how do these policies get in, um, implemented? Um, and the kind of bottlenecks, the red tape and all of that that is preventing some of these um, policies to take off. Um, so uh, those, are, those are, I think, some of the main sort of problems that we're seeing um, across the continent. Thank you very much, Fatima. I'll pass over to Sayyid, who's also going to talk a little bit about the indigenous, possible indigenous. Maybe just two quick points on the, uh, uh, the pol um, policy and how do you, do you implement that in the lessons learned. Because I think Fatma alluded to that, which is you'll find most African countries having uh, renewable energy uh, policy targets. I mean, most of the 53 African countries who submitted their INDCs have renewable energy targets. And I think that the link there is um, the difficulty to tap into grants to really develop the, the f not just the feasibility studies, but even the uh, uh, the, uh, the regulatory and, and, and policy frameworks. So the Green Climate Fund, for instance, now has a project preparation facility. And the last board meeting in March, um, Senegal, for instance, received a $600,000 grant to actually uh, develop the, the regulatory and policy framework. So right now, there is, there is grant finance to be able to, to move from, from policy to, to strategy and, 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 and project and, and, and action. Um, on lessons learned, yes, uh, we are taking that into consideration. The, uh, not just the Moroccan, the, 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 the Moroccan experience, the South African uh, experience, the uh, uh, renewable energy IPP unit actually uh, now has extended. Uh, it's, it's, um, there's a partnership with, with, with that unit and any African countries who is interested in implementing uh, similar or just sharing lessons. Uh, in Uganda, they have a very uh, successful uh, off-grid um, off small uh, renewable energy uh, IPP with both a feed-in tariff and a, a subsidy to, uh, to buy down the, uh, the, 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 the capex. So we are quite uh, familiar now with the, uh, the different experience happening on the continent. And again, this is, this is definitely uh, one of the, uh, the advantage of being 54 is that you can, you have different technologies, you have different policy regulatory frameworks, you have uh, different potentials, and uh, you have basically one place where all those 54 countries meet. So this is well taken into consideration. Thank you so much, Senyi. I'm just going to take a quick question, because you had a question, yeah, didn't you? Did, yeah. And then I'll, I'll call on Sam for his staff to say a few words. Yeah, it's uh, Jim Ski from Imperial College, bravely entering the UCL <laughs> premises. <laughs> and, uh, I'm also an uh, IPCC Working Group 3 co-chair. And I actually had a question for Sany about expectations of IPCC, uh, because the Paris Agreement included the invitation to IPCC to produce a report by 2018 on the climate impacts and emission pathways associated with 1.5 degrees. And my question really is about the hopes and expectations about that report whether what you're expecting to see is something quite narrow that reads the text uh, very narrowly or whether you're seeing something more comprehensive that covers adaptation, mitigation, uh, implications for development associated with 1.5 degrees. Because obviously as scientists we need to go out and scope that report at one point and I think you know, what the policy makers would expect from it is, is a very important consideration. Thank you very much. So, when are we going to get the report and what's going to be in it? To say you. Well, we're, we're quite ambitious in general. We, 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 we are interested in having a comprehensive understanding, meaning uh, from temperature to, uh, to mitigation adaptation and the, the, uh, the, um, in the context of, of sustainable development. We are also aware of the, uh, the lack of the, uh, the knowledge being produced. From what I understand, you aggregate yeah. existing knowledge. Yeah. So 
to the extent that that knowledge hasn't been produced, we are also interested as, as the Africa group of in sort of entering into a conversation with those scientists interested in producing the knowledge in the first place so IPCC can aggregate that knowledge because we wouldn't want to find our play ourselves in a situation where the knowledge hasn't been produced in the first place. We're quite interested in working with, with all in we're all interested to produce the work in the, in the first place. Thank you. I'll, I'll just ask Michelle, did you want to comment on what's going to go in the report? I think, I mean, I, I cannot comment on what Africa is expecting, but I think um, th th this question of 1.5 came as a, not, not a surprise, but as you said, it's a political necessity. And for some scientists, sometimes it's a question because we, we know that two degrees is already com complicated and that maybe 1.5 is almost more complicated. <coughs> I think that there are a couple of elements that are interested in the, interesting in studying the, the 1.5. One, one is uh, certainly 1.5 in Paris confirmed that we want to be below two degrees. <coughs> and it's important to, to understand the difference in terms of adaptation, in terms of uh, impact of a 1.5 scenario, a 2 degree scenario, etc. So to refine the understanding we have of impact and adaptation around those figures uh, compared with the, the, what we've done until now uh, with, the, with the different RCP. But I think there's a second question that is important that relates to timing that was mentioned, timing of action. Um, I think it's important for us to understand when we look at this objective 1.5 or 2 degree, most of the time the focus is on post-2050 to say, well, then we need to have these negative emissions, etc., etc. I'm not sure this is the main focus of such a report. I think the focus should be on what are the implications of having this objective of below 2 degree and possibly 1.5 for the action in the decades to come. So what is the impact of this in terms of revisiting the INDCs, revisiting ambition for 2020, as it is in the Paris Agreement, and then making the connection of this vis-a-vis -vis the consequences that we would have to pay after 2050 if we do this or this for 2020-2030, then what would be required after 2050, and do we think this is reasonable or not, given the expectations we have for different solutions like negative emissions, etc. So I would say I would put the focus of this report on what are the implications for the decision-making process in the years to come in the ambition of the Paris Agreement, um, and not so much on the, the end of the century solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll now hand just to quickly to Sam staff to say a few words. Yeah, well, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, the CDK has uh, worked with the development of the support policy uh, and uh, technical assistance to produce ca increased capacity and voice uh, in uh, national level but also in international processes. Uh, and it's, I'm really glad to be part of the ECL in this uh, event today. And one reason in particular really good to hear the strong narrative on decolonization um, and energy, which has come through really strongly. And I think after we went home from Paris, it wasn't quite clear, you know, what did that feel like? I knew what it felt like here in the UK to a certain extent, but what did it feel like in your countries, in Africa? And I think there's a strong narrative that's come through in, in, in what you said. So I think that's great. On the other hand, uh, we haven't heard very much from the panel about the adaptation challenge. Saini set out, uh, reminded us that, of course, there's a lot in the Paris Agreement about adaptation. A, a lot was not achieved that I think had been hoped for in terms of adaptation goal and specificity around finance. And Saini, I'd love to hear from you a little bit more about what are the solutions in, in terms of filling the climate finance gap, because it's very apparent that in, in, the, the finance gap in adaptation, uh, it's much more obvious that we've heard from the, 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 the ability to crash in very many sources Just for the acoustics, to just go over the question, it was all about the adaptation requirement and how that's going to be financed and whether the panel could address that. Uh, uh, thank you, Sam. I think the reason why we didn't hear that much about adaptation in the first place is because it's 
there's too many energy uh, in, this, <laughs> in the room. Maybe it's renewable energy, hopefully. But, I, but um, I'll take the uh, uh, I'll take the question. Actually, in the group, there's a there's a small number of of of, of us who had that task uh, in Paris in the run up to Paris, and I think it's unfortunate because we started quite late. Um, to have this idea about um, an adaptation target in the 100 billion. It's, it's, and it came out very clearly when the OECD uh, published its report. Uh, and, and, and of course, the, the report was not uh, endorsed by, by the COP uh, because um, rules have to be uh, multilaterally agreed. But the report is, is, um, is still relevant in the sense that the range of adaptation finance, I mean, the, 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 uh, the percentage of adaptation finance in any of, the rep any of the climate finance reports you see, whether it's Standing Committee on Finance or the uh, CPI landscape, it's always about 16 to 18%, less than 20%. So some of us felt that, and this, is, this was $8 billion in, in the uh, 62 of the OECD, that having a, uh, just doubling that amount in percentage point to get to 32% of adaptation uh, in the 100 billion would sort of triple the amount or quadruple the amount of, of finance in nominal value. So we started late that campaign. Um, actually, it's interesting, the US doubled its grant-based adaptation finance, but we're going from 400 million to 800 million. So we're very keen going into Morocco to actually start that campaign quite early and see if we can get, we can get a, concrete, uh, result, uh, a concrete result under that to really address <coughs> the urgency of adaptation now. In the Green Climate Fund, there's also uh, a push there to now uh, have uh, adaptation being addressed in a strategic or programmatic uh, manner uh, rather than a project-by-project than a, than, than a project basis. For instance, Fatima talked about, you know, how, but somehow the NGOs and civil society was involved. I think it's very important to, to really integrate the uh, climate change in the national development planning process. And uh, an adaptation initiative was also launched in, in Paris. Unfortunately, again, renewable energy took center stage. Everybody loves renewable. So we were not able to get that visibility. And we have developed we believe a very robust framework for adaptation, which you know, which which address those four pillars I've, I've uh, presented: uh, hydromet, climate services, institutional capacity building, finance instruments, not just finance having you know scaling finance, but different financial instruments to to address adaptation. And we hope that again in Marrakesh, uh, adapt the adaptation initiative will have will have uh, a center stage. The GCF is going to provide grant-based finance, uh, hopefully this started this year, for the development of national adaptation plans and then uh, for, for, um, for investment plans uh, for adaptation. So we have a very robust adaptation strategy this, this, this year, and, uh, and I hope that this, this time around it will, it will work. Yes. Can I have just one yes, word? Yes, absolutely. No, just to, to add on that, the way the renewable energy has been conceived, it is not only mitigation, it's adaptation. Because uh, Said just mentioned the uh, water pumping, uh, solar energy, solar water pump. Because if you want to make ag African agricultural sector resilient, climate resilient, you need water. And where water came is for energy. There is no way you can get energy without water. And then that, that, this related to that. It is not only to look at it as adaptation and mitigation, and then that responds to the question, and the fundamental question is on development, and then that united too. But there is some specific element of adaptation, such as what Saini uh, said on the observational system and then how to anticipate. But some of the concrete elements, both are uh, related. I have one. Excellent. Excellent. I'll just take this lady's sure. question. She's been waiting for a while. Thank you very much. Anna Haiduka from Africa Green Co. I have a few connected questions, if you don't mind, so I think everyone might get a chance to, to speak. I think going back to first to um, 
Fatima, I think I, 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 you said something that was really striking in terms of tension between imperative to develop a green economy and finance and ability to do so. Now, whilst we are hearing very good examples coming from Morocco and South Africa in particular, uh, some of them are through, because of very innovative and very strong institutional support, but also because the reality of those markets from the debt and local debt and equity point of view is very different to the reality in other sub-Saharan African markets. So it's easier to raise finance potentially in those countries. And also the credit worthiness of off-takers of those two countries in particular is different to the other countries in sub-Saharan Africa in terms of going back to what is a bankable project. The scale in those countries is much larger and the sovereign guarantees are in place, whilst many other countries have very strict IMF restrictions on ability to give more sovereign guarantees. Now, taking all that into account, from, um, Dr. Moline, I would love to hear more on, in terms of um, sharing the knowledge of Moroccan example of how you created quite an innovative scheme to de-risk private sector investment by creating this intermediary purchaser effectively through the agency of Manston, if I cor understand correctly. Because that's a great credit mitigator that can be potentially replicated elsewhere. And then going back to the first point, which was on more regional aspects, and what Sena just said on new financial instruments. So uh, could I ask Fatima, please, you, uh, whilst we have the Africa Clean Energy Corridor Initiative, which is fantastic, and it shows the potential for renewable energy development on a regional basis, is anyone looking at new financial instruments that could de-risk investment required on a re re regional basis for those countries that do not have the debt and other markets reality and credit worthiness of off-takers reality that two countries we mentioned as, as examples have? Thank you. Wonderful. I'm going to go to Fatima first because Morocco's had <laughs> quite a lot of airing. Tell us what happens outside Morocco. <laughs> well, I think for me, I think there are three categories of um, countries in Africa, especially in terms of decarbonizing, um, you know, going down the decarbonizing pathway. Um, there are the first <coughs> categories which to me are more like the front runners and you might include Morocco in that, Mozambique, South Africa, um, Ethiopia to some extent, um, that are sort of way forward in terms of their efforts towards decarbonizing their economies and they're looking at other sectors, they're looking at forestry, they're looking at agriculture, so it's not just the sort of energy um, driven kind of um, decarbonized route. Um, there, are, there is a second category which is more or less those that are aspiring towards going down that route. Um, and, um, you know, there are, there are countries, um, I don't know whether one can put Rwanda in that, in that category, but there are certainly those countries um, that want to get it right. Um, they may not have all the answers, but they want to get it right. And there, there, are, there is a third category which is more or less the laggards um, that they don't have an idea or a clue in terms of how to get there. So I think we've been talking quite a lot about ratcheting up ambition. Um, and I think it would be useful to see how you can ratchet ambition, not in terms of carbon counting, but more in terms of sustainable development, which I think is a point that you were making earlier on. So how do you use, for instance, the Green Climate Fund? Um, how do you use other initiative um, to ratchet up ambition to the extent that these countries would say, here is a conduit in terms of how I could get my renewable energy targets right, this is how I could decarbonize my economy, this is how I could use agriculture, forestry, um, you know, um, energy to be able to go down the growth um, pathway. Um, so our emphasis, I think, should not be so much, I mean, mitigation is important, but our emphasis should not be so much on a mitigation pathway, our emphasis should be very much on an adaptation um, sort of um, formula. Um, but I think that we do not have sufficient solutions and responses on how to do adaptation. The impacts are happening so fast and the learning is not fast enough. Um, so I think we need to find a way, in, in as much as we're looking at all these regional initiatives, we need to find a way of growing the experience on the reg at, the regional um, at the regional level because many countries also do not have the, the resources 
um, they can't go, go at it alone. So they need that kind of regional harmonization, ways of looking at the problem collectively. But the global governance in itself does not allow that. The global governance is very much on a national driven level, you know, national adaptation programs, national this, national that. that. So I think we need to find a way of forcing the, gro the global governance mechanism to look at a more regional um, sort of dimension or more regional approaches in terms of how you can create solution. As long as we take it at this sort of piecemeal national something, national this, it becomes more or less a, a begging goal. Although African countries do not want to identify with that goal anymore. They want to get away from that. They want to bring in their own initiatives, their own monies. There are many INDCs that are I mean, you have the conditional versus the, the, the non-conditional. There are many countries that want to put in their own monies. So they're not going at it in terms of the international solidarity way. They're basically saying that this is about my own development and I would invest monies into this to be able to arrive at this um, set of results. So I think that there is, there is, a, there is a big move um, for many countries in Africa um, whereby they are looking at all sorts of fi um, um, funding sources, all sorts of mechanism. Um, money is from remittances from the diaspora, green bonds, you know, um, um, public-private um, partnerships. So different sorts of um, ways in which domestic um, resource mobilization, different ways in which you can, you can, you can actually um, pull money to get monies together. Um, and the issue of absorptive capacity that we talk about so much um, is not as big as it used to be. Um, because that was one thing we were saying was blocking or at least preventing countries from coming up with bankable proposals. Um, but we know that um, that is not so much an issue. What we need to do is find ways of capitalizing the Green Climate Fund, using the Green Climate Fund as a metaphor to enable countries to arrive at their development um, ambitions and aspirations much faster. Um, so that way, at least um, whilst they're looking at the protection of the environment, they're also looking at their own um, vested interests um, in ensuring that they arrive at some form of industrialization, sustainable development, all of those things that matter. So I think, I think those are some of the big issues um, in many ways that it seems to me that the Paris Agreement hasn't really um, found answers to. It hasn't really talked about how do you divide responsibilities. I mean, somebody was saying we shouldn't talk about burden, but there's still a burden issue. There's a huge opportunity, but it's still a burden in terms of who does what <coughs> in this agreement. Where does international solidarity start? Where does it stop? You know, can I use my own funds to do certain things? Am I, in that case, leaving behind some of my core priorities of development? You know, how do we do all of those things? A quick word from Saeed um, on how well, very, very quick. How well Morocco No, it's very important because when I mentioned that dedicated institutions, why we could develop the project with the utility, we prefer to have an institution dedicated only to that project. That's why we managed in four years to have, from the creation of the agency, to have the first plant connected to the grid. That's why it's very important to have this in mind, even if the utility is having shares in this agency. It's not a problem. It's the matter that you have a RC dedicated to those projects and you can reach this uh, result. Adaptation, I want to add something. We are, uh, one thing very important, we, are, we have to innovate to have public-private partnership for adaptation. We have one project, Southern Morocco near Agadir, where a private company is developing uh, uh, water, develop, water distribution for farmers done by the private sector. It's the first project that we are just developing. It's very important, and maybe it can be helped to find more other public partnership for adaptation will be one of issue. Thank you. So I've got a question at the very back there. Let's see if I can. Thank you very much, uh, Michael Grubb, a professor uh, in um, the Institute of Sustainable Resources here. Um, two interrelated questions that, that try and bring this to the international level. Um, one is when one looks back at the history of now more than 20 years of COPs, you see high points, you know, Berlin, Kyoto, a few others. Frequently, the COP afterwards has been quite difficult, sometimes a bit either disappointment or 
you know, an attempt by countries to sort of who were compromised uh, reluctantly under the big spotlight and pressure to claw back and say, well, we didn't really mean that. We didn't really. So, my first question is, what do you see as the potential risks for the Marrakesh COP from any signs that any countries kind of want to unravel something or <coughs> reinterpret what Paris uh, uh, agreed? The related issue is about the geopolitics in Africa. Um, because I think it's still the case that certainly viewed from Washington or London or Berlin or Brussels, maybe less so Paris, the real eyes are what's the deal between the US, Europe and China. And I'm really interested to see what does that look like from Africa? How do you see Africa's role in that kind of geopolitical uh, games around the next phase of global negotiations? Really interesting questions. I'll try not to break my neck. I'm going to go to you, first. I think that. No, I think this is a. No, this is the negotiation question. I will leave that to 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 Okay. All right. There you go. We tried to offer him a position. No. Not me. <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, the potential, I think the potential risk, we'll start addressing the potential risk in interpreting what we have agreed on different, uh, uh, on different theme. I can, for instance, we can take transparency. Transparency has been a, a bitterly debated issue uh, over the years, and um, so far, uh, developing countries wanted a bifurcated system and now there is one system with flexibility now to what extent that flexibility is going to be is going to be applied so i think the question is more how are we going to to you know when developing the new frameworks tools and instruments how are we going to still apply those um, uh, uh, principles and uh, uh, and rights and duties countries have. So I think that's, that's technical in nature. I don't see any real political potential risk for, for, for uh, Marrakesh. I mean, I, I'll see one, which I'll tell you, you know, when we, in a very informal, there's, there's one series, but not here, not now, when, when we'll break for. Um, now on the geopolitical, I think that's quite, you know, something new has happened, I think, in the last two or three years. Africa has decided that the continent wants uh, climate as a fundamental pillar in its diplomacy. Uh, we have realized that whether, uh, whether with the US or you know, we have EU Africa summits, we have now, we had two years ago the first Africa US summit. We've had for some time a China. Uh, uh, China Africa summits, even the TCAD. So, with all those global players, and I'm going back to the 2.3 percent, because if we if we only represent 2.3 percent, how do we then have a say? So, there's this effort of integrating climate change as a separate pillar in the cooperation framework with all the different with all the different partners, and I think it has worked it has worked very well in Paris. If you remember. Uh, on December 1st, President Hollande had an Africa Climate Summit, and this is, I think this is unheard of, but you would have a summit for a specific region uh, to deal with, you know, to deal with uh, uh, issues which are specific to, to, uh, to that. So we are very well aware of Africa's uh, uh, unique, unique place. Nobody actually wants to upset Africa, in, 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 and, and and this is something we are learning to put in our uh, in our advantage, and we'll definitely uh, push it forward in in Marrakesh on African soil. No. Is there something on the risk? Yeah, Michelle. Just not not on African politics because it's not my <laughs> my field, but just on the, on the risk uh, that that you mentioned. I think. Well, w one risk is that the this uh, relates to this universality of rules versus coming back to the old discussion of having di different rules, etc. I think the other risk is um, if we understand the success of Paris, it's because we had this um, 
this important success of INDCs prior to Paris. And the success of INDCs, I think, was a commitment to this new paradigm that we have discussed. And basically, I think the, 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 the big push was from developing countries, because it's really developing countries who made a shift from the previous position that was, no, we are not responsible for climate, so we should not act, etc., in the previous paradigm. And it's these countries that came before Paris with ambitious INDCs saying, OK, we are also participating in the global, uh, in the global uh, action against climate change. So th this was very important. But we all know also that these INDCs, when summing up INDCs, are not ambitious enough. This is not because of the European countries. This is because of the overall ambition of, uh, of INDCs. We know we are not ambitious enough. We know it's not business as usual. It's half the way. It's not ambitious enough. And one very important feature of the Paris Agreement, I think, is that we have convinced all parties that Paris was about building a dynamic agreement and that we had, you, you, you say there's nothing will happen before 2020. I think it's important that a lot of things happened before 2020 in the implementation, in the operationalization of a number of tools that are in the Paris Agreement and in this dynamic vision that countries need to come back before 2020 with revised NDCs to be aligned with the objective of Article 2 of Paris. And this is, this is still something that is, I think, very fragile. A number of, very fragile. A number of countries now are coming back to the vision. We've put forward INDCs. Mm. This is now the way to 2030. And if this is the way to 2030, then the Paris Agreement mm. would fail in its ambition, I think. Because its ambition is not to have uh, to have stuck these INDCs, it is to transform those INDCs into more ambitious action towards 2030. So I think this is still very important. And then it will be in the details in how we discuss the stock taking issue, in how we discuss all the small em elements that will bring that community to discuss before 2020 the new NDCs that need to be put forward. I think this is still a very fragile element. Saying he wants to say something in 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 it's going to be because I forgot there's a potential risk, there's a serious one. It's because I know I'm, I'm putting my new hat on the political momentum. I think the biggest risk some of us see is if we drop political momentum. If in Paris on the 30th you had ambassadors in Paris and not heads of state, I'm not sure that we get the outcome we'll have. So, for instance, <laughs> the next milestone for us is April 22nd. Yeah. How many heads of state are you going to have yeah. April 22nd? And it's very important. And, uh, and uh, actually, I was in, in, Mar in, in, in Rabat uh, a couple of weeks ago. The Moroccan incoming presidency is quite aware of that. But you need to really mobilize heads of state. And you need to push to have an early entry into force. And again, it's not the early entry. The, er the entry into force is not 2020. It's double threshold, 50-50. Mm, yes. I mean, 55-55. And, and we might be here. Yeah, and this might be the first time <coughs> but we could actually reach it because of the dynamic in the US. Mm. You might actually have the US be the first G7 country to join. So that could, so there's, but the political momentum is the biggest risk if we can maintain that and have an early entry into force. And to revisit the NDC process. Yes, yes. Mm. On, on that note, um, and, and really talking about the risks, but hoping for optimism, I'm going to pass over to um, Bob Lowe now to wrap up. <coughs> well, uh, Mr. Son, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Um, in my experience, it is unusual for discussions around climate change to be characterised by positive uh, feelings. <laughs> <laughs> or Only for Africa that happens. <laughs> but on reflection, I'm not that surprised. There is a historical tendency for policies for renewables to... Uh. Uh, exceed expectations. I'm thinking here of the example of Denmark, which is smaller than Africa. Uh, but it seems to me that what's happening here is that Africa is beginning to test this proposition at continental scale. So just watch this space. Uh, and uh, so to uh, wrapping up, uh, the original impetus for the fifth uh, UCL Embassy cycle of events 
came from uh, my colleague uh, Ian Scott uh, of UCL Brand Challenges. Uh, Ian, would you like to face the music? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ian rang me uh, in July last year to ask me if the Energy Institute would like to take on the organisation of uh, this present cycle, and I said yes. Normally I regret saying yes, <laughs> but on this occasion I'll make an exception. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, funding for this event was put together, uh, provided by the French Embassy, by CDKN, uh, by STEEP, and by UCL Grand Challenges. And my thanks go to Cyril von Eppenter, uh, Sam Bickersteff, and Jason Blackstock. Uh, the event program, a list of panelists for this evening's event, was put together by Jakob Mugetta. Jakob, please stand up. Uh, <laughs> I am in awe of what you've done. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful uh, events. I would like to thank UCL's pro Vice Provost uh, for Africa and the Middle East, Joe Mutchekin, for facilitating this evening's event. Uh, wonderful facilitation. Detailed planning and logistics was dealt with by Romy. Stop sculpting. Oh. Uh, who is one of our undergraduates. If this is uh, Jason um, uh, 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 Yakov, if this is what your undergraduates are like, I would I would quire them to greet your postgraduate. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.